Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. My name is Howard, and I'm an alcoholic. Great honor to be here. I thank the committee for uh, asking me, and uh, it, it's uh, I, I want to say that whatever prompted the committee to pick Matt as my host, it was a good deal. This guy is good. I don't know where he's trying to go from here, but he's sure getting the job done. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, I'm honored to be here. I, I want to thank all the other speakers. Uh, everyone knows that this is a great honor and that the speakers, they try to get good speakers, and so far they have. Uh, now, the quality of my talk is not as good as any that you've heard so far. But mine will be longer. <laughs> I will, I will add quantity. I, I, uh, I lost this joke. Somebody, somebody else started using the joke and then when I kept using it, they said, oh, you got that from the judge. Well, I didn't. But God give me back my joke. Uh, when I, I will, as I'm talking, look at, uh, look at my clock from time to time, my watch. I don't look at it to see what time it is. I look at it to give those of you that are worried about it a sense of optimism <laughs> that I care what time it is. I don't want you to be worried about it. Uh, I also, make up stuff, and say that it's in the big book. I give page numbers. And nobody ever checks. Afterwards, they say, he wasn't much of a speaker, but damn, he sure knew the big book, didn't he? You know? And uh, it adds credibility. So, uh, I... I, I was uh, Beth. Beth. We all have things in common, but Beth and I were both born in California. I was born a thousand years ago. Uh, she not that long. And uh, but when I was first born in California, we moved out. My folks were Okies, about six times over. I was the sixth kid born in eight years. I was born in 1932, but the first home I had was in Kansas. They had a kid in Kansas, a kid in California, a kid in Kansas, a kid in California, a kid in Kansas, a kid in California, and then we went back and uh, uh, settled there. And um, we were living in what I had always thought was the Bible Belt. Uh, the little farm town about 45 miles southwest of Wichita, and uh, in the wheat, it was a, a, a wheat area, and uh, uh, we thought we were in the Bible Belt. It turns out, though, that the people in Oklahoma think they're in the Bible Belt. The people in Texas, the people in Nebraska, the people in South Dakota, North Dakota, uh, everybody thinks, well, not everybody, but, well, the people in Los Angeles know they are not in the Bible Belt. <laughs> and I'll tell you, they're happy as hell about that. They're just very tickled. I also understand the people in New York City also aren't in the Bible Belt, but, uh, uh, so no one knows where the Bible Belt is, but I know that it buckles about 45 miles southwest of Wichita. Right there in this little community that I lived in. And I've had several requests about this next story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. 
we had free movies in our little farm town on Saturday night so that the farmers would come to our town to, to use our stores. And it was an outside movie. And, and a short feature that I remembered was about training wild elephants in India. And they rounded up the wild elephants and they took the babies out, the baby elephants out of the herd and they trained them by tying a rope around the right front leg and snubbing them up to a big tree. And the elephants would pull and tug and pull and tug until their experience taught them to come to believe that when that rope's tight, it's futile to pull. Then they went into the next phase of the training, but each subsequent phase included a reinforcement of that initial truth that when the rope is tight, it's futile to pull. So at the end of the movie, there was a huge elephant pulling trees out of the forest with a harness to harvest them. And at the lunch break, in order to keep the elephant where they wanted him, they drove a little stake in the ground, put a rope around that stake, put a rope around his right front leg, and while he could walk around, when he got to the end of the rope and it got tight, he couldn't pull loose from the rope or the stake. Now, the stake didn't hold the elephant. The rope didn't hold the elephant. What held the elephant was the limiting belief that they imposed on him when he was a baby and had reinforced through the rest of his life. And I was at an AA meeting and I heard a guy talking about why he was a Republican or a Democrat. I don't know what he was. <laughs> but he listed reasons why he was what he was, and, and every, all his party members were applauding. And uh, But he said, that's not really the truth. I'm in the political party of my men because my dad told me to. And on the way home, I thought of the baby elephant, you know. All this stuff you get imposed on you that you don't know is true. You don't even know you know it. Yet, your sense of well-being depends upon your ability to make it the truth. And I came in to AA with about 650,902 baby elephant beliefs, which... I don't even know I have. One of them was, and uh, uh, I heard somebody, and one of the other speakers were talking about it earlier. Uh, it's it's a separate a feeling of separation from God. Uh, God's up in heaven behind the pearly gates on the streets of gold. And I don't care if they'd have told me he was in Kansas City, I would have known we were separate. But I knew we were separate, and I knew the way you had to do what God wanted you to do. I learned that there, too. That's a good baby elephant leaf. And company that, there's a hell of a lot of people back there that can tell you what God wants you to do. And I never got the hang of doing that. Now, the first, now, if you're doing what God wants you to do, then you can beseech him in prayer in times of trouble, and he'll help you. And uh, the first time I remember praying and knowing who I was praying to and what I was praying for was the Sunday morning, the day before wheat harvest was starting, and we prayed for it not to rain so that the farmers could get their equipment in the field for harvest. Now, I didn't know it, but after harvest, you prayed to God just as fervently for it to rain so that you could plow and sow next year's crop. Then you prayed for rain again. And that particular first prayer we had where we prayed for it not to rain, it rained that day. It hailed that day. The wind blew that day and wiped out all the wheat in Sumner County, Kansas. And while nobody pointed the finger at me, I knew whose fault it was. <laughs> I knew who wasn't doing what God wanted you to do, and therefore the prayer didn't work. Now, if you're 
four or five or six years old and you assume the entire responsibility for wiping out the Kansas sweet crop, what you have is an ego problem. <laughs> the old control, you know, basing your sense of well-being on controlling things that you lack the power to control. But it's just the only way you know to live your life. My, 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 all my grandparents came from Germany. And I don't mean happy-go-lucky Bavarian beer garden Germany. I mean Prussia, Nazis really, disciplinarians. And, uh, my, my dad had, my dad and mom had six kids in eight years. My dad was an alcoholic. He had a seventh grade education. And, uh, he wanted obedience. And I'm not sure that I didn't have attention deficit disorder, which he, he might as well said I had, almost, you know, he would not know what the hell attention deficit is, but he would whip you. And, uh, and by God, you'd know the next time, you know. Uh, why did you do that? I don't know. Well, you'll know the next time. And... Uh, uh, being whipped and being beaten. I had about three beatings. And being beaten doesn't make you an alcoholic. However, I never got where I liked being beaten. I understand <laughs> that there are people that get where they like that. They <laughs> hang each other up and whip. <laughs> I don't go for that, I'm telling you. I've never asked her, but I don't think Pat would go for that either. <laughs> uh, so, I didn't feel good. I did, I did not feel good about being the son I was, being the brother I was, uh, being the school student I was. And uh, uh, it just didn't ever feel good. If you're feeling good, the worst you can feel is zero, and the best you can feel is ten. I ran about a three. That was my top feeling, was a three. And the goodness of the feeling three was you knew everything was kind of okay now, but you also were in a state of low-grade alert that something bad is going to happen soon, you know, and that's the best feeling I had up until I was about 12 or 13, and I drank about half of a half a pint of whiskey. And there you have it. You know, we all know, all of the alcoholics here know the change that has in your life. It's the first time, and you don't just feel good, you feel an ache. You know, you go from a two or three to an eight, and then you go to a two and a half. Uh, but that doesn't bother you, because while you know you don't want to be down to one and a half or a two, and you're not going to do that again, by God, you're going for the eight. You have now discovered how to feel good. And that was the way I felt good from... When I uh, was 13 up until uh, uh, that the same year, I think, that the uh, uh, Gopher State Roundup came to AA was the year I came to AA. And uh, uh, I, I started to learn how to feel good then on the Nats. But I'm telling you, it has not been quite that easy. In the, in the back of the big book, in the third edition, it's page 569. It describes the spiritual awakening in language like a, a, uh, a change of consciousness followed at once by a vast change in feeling and outlook. Now just 
Think about that description. A change of consciousness followed at once by a vast change in feeling and outlook. Okay? Is that about a half of a half a pint of whiskey? You betcha it is. That was the spiritual awakening. And it just didn't take long. Then in their description, in our description in the big book, we talk about the educational, the educational variety, which takes some time, which we know about. Uh, so I drank whiskey to feel good, and uh, I fell in love with Pat when we were in the seventh grade. And uh, there were just 21 kids in our in our class, and and uh, I know what falling in love is. Okay, I didn't know at the time, but the truth is, there is a spirit. My truth is, Bill Wilson's truth is, there's a spirit of the universe that underlies the totality of things. That would be me, that would be you, and that would be Pat. Now, falling in love is when your spirit resonates with her spirit and your spirits know that you're one. Now, that's love. How it gets into your consciousness, though, it has to come up through your ego. And my ego said, I want to see her naked. Well, I'll just tell you, that was not going to (laughs) happen until we got married. I mean, that was, there was uh, none of that. So, uh, anyway, uh, when, when I, when I tell Clancy, I love you, what I'm saying is, when we first met, our spirits resonated. And I knew that we were one. And then we joined together to nurture that oneness. That's our relationship. Is that we share our spirit and we nurture that for, uh, to, uh, to nurture our spirit. And, uh, AA, when we, when we talk about love and AA, that's what we're talking about. And we live love here. That's what love is, and that's what we do. And uh, to get from where I was to even knowing that, let alone being able to practice it, is truly a transformation. I, 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 when I drank to feel good, I felt good. I got a job as an entry-level engineer after Pat and I were married, and uh, I didn't have a degree yet. I was working on it, but I didn't have it, and I got the job. So I was afraid going in. And alcoholics are spring-loaded to anxiety and anger. You know, we're just, we're, we're, our, our brain chemistry gets us there. And, uh, uh, and, and I had to write technical reports. I was an analyst, and I was a good analyst. But you gotta write technical reports, and I didn't know how to write. And, and, uh, and I just seized up with anxiety. And one time I brought some work home on a Wednesday night to write the report. I thought if I just had time to write the report with nobody pressuring me, I could do it. And I couldn't do it. I would, I would seize up just like, uh, I did at work. And, now, I had no specific plan in mind, but I got up to go over to see what was going on in the refrigerator. <laughs> and I opened the refrigerator door, and what was going on in there was a neighbor had left a, a, bot, a pint bottle of whiskey, the old crow, which was about half full, and uh, uh, I just thought I'd have a drink. It wasn't. You know, but I had to drink, 
And I went over and sat down. And, uh, and I sipped it a little more. And then it occurred to me, why don't you briefly describe what prompted you to do this analysis in the first place? And then succinctly describe the analysis results. And then propose changes to the process based on this analysis. I got up and went and got the bottle. <laughs> and I came back and uh I wrote him a report. I mean, it was a good report. I knew it was. I wasn't drunk. I was brilliant. <laughs> Whiskey all at once made me brilliant. And uh I had a technical vocabulary I didn't know I had. And I wrote this report and the next Tuesday, you know, it had to be done by Friday. All reports have to unless you're on the streets. <laughs> Clancy said one time, not, you know, one of the good things about being on the street is there ain't no report to have to be turned in for Friday. Uh, <laughs> damn, I thought that's right. Uh, <laughs> I always had to have these stupid reports in. And anyway, the next Tuesday, my boss's boss's boss come out with my report. And he said, did you write this report, Howard? And I said, yes, sir. He said, this is an excellent report. I said, well, thank you. He said, we knew you could do it if you just give us the effort. And I thought, effort, effort. I gave you effort. It wasn't effort. It was whiskey. But I also thought, don't tell him that. Let him think effort. They'll pay you for effort. They'll fire you for whiskey. I mean, uh, but whiskey it was. Whiskey helped me feel good, and whiskey helped me function. And I went from a process analyst to an engineer to a senior engineer, then to Hughes up in Culver City as kind of a senior senior engineer, and then an engineering manager a progressive series of promotions that I got because I drank whiskey. And I'm telling you, if I didn't drink whiskey, that would not have happened. It's just that towards the last of this, you have to drink so much whiskey before you're brilliant that your speech is slurred. Your wife thinks you're drunk. Your boss thinks you're drunk. Your boss says, you know, if you don't do something about your drinking, come in here with your speech slurred when you start out the day. I said, you ain't going to have this job very long. And uh, God sent a guy in my life. I drank in a bar called the Tattletale. And uh, and a guy sent a guy in. God sent a guy into the Tattletale who sold little white pills with crosses on them, which he stacked on top of each other and then wrapped them with tinfoil. And when you looked at them, you thought, hell, these look like lifesavers. These were lifesavers, I'm telling you. (laughs) Vinnies and booze take care of every problem you have except controlling your body functions. (laughs) <laughs> don't help much there. But I'll tell you this. Anybody that's taken Benny, their speech is not slurred. I don't care how much they drink. They'll say the same things over and over and over <laughs> real fast. <laughs> you know, and then your boss demotes you and takes 10% of your salary. And, and I was already in debt. Pat don't know it, but we owe 2500 to the Bank of America and and to the credit union, and there's no money coming in to pay this. And I had an opportunity to sell some equipment that I didn't own. <laughs> equipment that I found right before the owner lost it. <laughs> and uh, I gave it to a fence, and he disappeared with it. And I didn't get any money for this, but but I was sitting in the tattletale, and I told the bartender, or told the owner, actually, 
I said, if you know anybody that wants some test equipment, tell me about it, and I'll see if I can find them some. You see, whiskey had stopped making me smart. That's the dumbest thing you can do, I think, if you're going to steal stuff, is is uh, direct sales. You need a fence. <laughs> but you need an honest fence. Now, there is a little difficult thing right there, but you got to find an honest crook. <laughs> anyway, I woke up the next morning. It was uh, July the 26th, 1972, on page 8 in the big book. There are no words to express the loneliness and despair I found in that bitter morass of self-pity. Quicksand stretches out in every direction. In my family, in my community, at work, with my friends, every place. My life is disintegrating, it's sinking, and there's nothing except a double shot that can stop the sinking. And I know I have to, I know I'm in trouble. I know the dumbest FBI guy who might be investigating the loss of the equipment, the dumbest FBI guy in the world will just go around as the first thing to the bars, <laughs> around the the factory where this stuff was lost and say, you know anybody that's selling where I could get some test equipment? Yeah, Howard Poland. Well, <laughs> you know, and uh, I knew I had to stop drinking until the equipment thing blew over. Now, I also knew there was a program called Alcoholics Anonymous. My dad had joined Alcoholics Anonymous on July the 6th 1946, and he died sober at an AA meeting uh, March the 8th, 1951. And uh, so I knew AA existed, but he was a Mason and very esoteric. All this stuff was secret, and his AA stuff was secret. Uh, and, and so I didn't really find out except one thing, and that was alcoholics are people who drink in the morning. That's it. And I believed that up until I started drinking in the morning. <laughs> as soon as I drank in the morning, I didn't know what the hell alcoholics drank in the morning for, but it got rid of my hangover. And uh, that's the only thing that did. And, and so uh, I always knew where to draw the line. Right behind me. <laughs> as, as, <laughs> Uh, anyway, I, uh, <laughs> I called this guy that I had worked with eight years ago, drank with in the Tattletail also, and he was now the president of AA Worldwide, which was information we had in the Tattletail on the guy. And so I called him and asked me, asked him if he was still in AA, and he said, yes, yes. And I said, well, Sometime I want you to take me to a meeting. He said, let's go tonight. My home group meets tonight. It's a beginner's meeting. And uh, uh, I, uh, I said, oh, no, not tonight. I've got, I've got important business tonight, but sometime. Well, you know, he talked me into going to the meeting with him in spite of my pressing schedule. And uh, on the way to the meeting, I told him, that I was not really an alcoholic. I don't know if I want to quit drinking forever, but I got problems that I got to stop drinking so that I can get them taken care of. But I'm I'm not an alcoholic, I don't think. And he said, I don't know if you're an alcoholic or not, but I think we're going to the right place. <laughs> <laughs> and the first guy there was that he introduced me to was a guy named Frank Giroux. Clancy knew Frank, and, and Clancy loved Frank, and, and, and but, but uh, Frank, this is his smile. And his big smile was, and when, he, he was Kenny Sixberry's uh, 
uh, sponsor, and Kenny introduced me to him. We were the only people at the meeting then, and and uh, Frank put his little leather notebook down and shook hands with me and said, Howard, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. If you will join us in doing the things we do and don't do the things we don't do, and stay with us, your life will be magnitudes better than you ever dreamed it would be uh, in a relatively short time. He said, it's not as fast as whiskey, but it is relentless. If you stay with us, your life will get relentlessly better. And uh, I thought, I wonder who in the hell taught this jerk a word like relentless. That's a too big a word for this guy, let alone magnitudes. But I'll tell you this, in the tattletale, we were deep thinkers. In the tattletale, we thought deep thoughts. I don't know about you guys in your bars, but we thought of things like Nothing is as easy as it looks. If something can go wrong, it will go wrong. And at the worst possible time. My God, tell me that. Let's write that down. <laughs> that is the fundamental truth about life. Let's put that on the bulletin board. Life sucks, and then you die. Put that up there. Don't trust anyone. I believe it isn't just that we looked for that. We believed it. That was the hole we had put our life in. When it says you gotta let go of your old ideas. I mean, that's where you're starting from. There's a good one to let go of. And without even trying, I trusted Frank. He was, he was grumpy. And uh, it made no effort for me to like him. <laughs> but I liked him. And uh, I will, I'll give you one more, you know. Uh, that night, they just, uh, uh, we had an old timer in the group with a guy named Chuck Ennis who passed away. But he had 50, uh, maybe 55, but there were 50 years when he passed away. And he had, he was 24, 25 when uh, uh, I got there. And and it was a beginner's meeting. And if they said, is there anybody here in the first meeting, my hand went up. And I didn't know that that changed the tenor of the meeting. The format changed now, so the topic is, what is alcoholism? And how do you stop drinking? Chuck, you have anything to share? Every time there was somebody's hand went up, it would call on Chuck and and he would go through the big book by memory about alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control their drinking. And that the loss of control is characterized by an insane obsessive belief each time we started it. Tonight we would just have one, two, three at the most. And last thing you know is last call for alcohol. And you're ready to fight with the bartender saying, you got the clock set up. There's plenty of time for me to have another drink. <laughs> this is after you were just going to have one, two, three at the most. You know, and he said the reason for that is, coupled with that insane, obsessive belief, is a physical reaction peculiar to alcoholics as a class of people that manifests itself in a phenomenon of craving for more, a phenomenon much stronger than your willpower. A phenomenon coming from a place in your brain that your willpower can't access. And you're, uh, as soon as you start drinking, if you're an alcoholic, you can't stop until you're out of it. And I, I thought, well, there's a lot of me in there. But I've never had a craving. I have never experienced a craving to drink. So I must be off, you know, 
I'm not an alcoholic yet, but I'm going to stay not going to drink until this equipment blows over. But very quickly, I'm not going to work the steps. And I told Kenny at the break that I never craved a drink. He said, what time do you start drinking, Howard? I said, about six in the morning. <laughs> Why did you drink so early? Because I had a hangover. And the only way to get rid of the hangover, need to be rid of the hangover, because I'd be at work at seven. And... Uh, <laughs> And he said, uh, okay, I understand that. He said, I understand that. Now, when you got rid of the hangover, did you keep drinking? See, I'm not stupid. I know he's got me trapped now. <laughs> but I just decided to tell him the truth. And that was, yes, I kept drinking. But I didn't crave it. I just wanted another drink. <laughs> I thought I had him trapped, but he said, alcoholics only experience the craving if when they start to drink, they try to stop. If they keep slugging them down as fast as they can, the craving never has an opportunity to set in. I thought, well, maybe I'm that kind of an alcoholic. I, I, I didn't really believe I was because I ran one more experiment. It proved that I was an alcoholic. But but the second half of that meeting was about God. And they said to for the new people, don't worry about God. They they read from page ninety three where it says <laughs> emphasize to the new people that whatever concept of God they had would work for them, provided it made sense to them. Well, you see, that was the perfect thing for me to hear, because the things I had been taught and preached, had preached to me, never made sense to me. I, 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 and I could never make it work in my life. And uh, my life, as far as I was concerned, my religious life was working fine. I believed that God had created the universe. And that he had created it with immutable laws. And that everything was going to happen in accordance with the law. And if you could figure out, including in your culture, how those laws work and you live your life that way, then you would be successful. And that's how I got, went from an entry-level engineer to an engineering manager. But I had to drink whiskey to get there. And so this, I had to stop drinking. And, uh, and, and they said, don't worry about God. In, this, in that part where they start, don't worry about God. Fake it till you make it. I said, well, well, that don't work. And uh, uh, they said, uh, act as if. Well, I acted as if in a whole series of Protestant churches and was getting ready for the Catholic church. And, and uh, I was just running into all kinds of stuff that I couldn't kid myself. If you're going to fake it till you make it, it would imply that you're going to believe that it's there when you don't really believe it. And and I, that won't work. The next guy, they wouldn't call on him. He kept holding his hand up and they wouldn't call on him. And uh, and so he just jumped right up and said, my name is John, I'm an alcoholic. Hello, John. And he said, they also call me John the Baptist. They call me John the Baptist because Jesus Christ is my higher power. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And when I get up in the morning, I ask Jesus to keep me sober. Jesus is with me throughout the day. And at the end of the day, I thank him for my sobriety. And I want to thank Alcoholics Anonymous for bringing my Savior back into my life. And I thought, that's not bad if you can con yourself into that fantasy. 
But I have to live in the real world. Which that day was four half pints of whiskey and a lethal dose of Benzedrine. <laughs> How's that for a real world? Well, that was my real world. And, uh, and, the, and, the, and, and then they said, don't forget about old Joe. Joe has been sober in AA for 150 years. And his higher power was a doorknob. A doorknob. A doorknob? Are you, you know, okay with me, Joe, if you, you know, if it's working for you, have at it. On the way out, Leo Hingley, who was our second oldest guy in the group, who's lost both him and Chuck, Leo had John the Baptist up against the wall next to the coffee and saying, I told you don't bring Jesus into the AA meeting. You're going to scare away the newcomer. I thought, I didn't go back, I wish I would have went back and said, Hey, Leo, if you're not going to scare him away with the doorknob, I wouldn't worry about Jesus. I think... Yeah. So I got I got drunk one more time. It was a week on August the fourth, nineteen seventy-two. I had my last drink, and uh, that, <laughs> that <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm honored to have this time, and uh, I, I'm grateful, and I know that when I was doing it, it wasn't happening. And and this is what this is what has transformed my life, being with you folks. So uh I I said to I got drunk one more time and I, my my purpose in drinking was to prove that I could drink a half of a half a pint and not drink anymore. And I could not stop doing that for four days. I was on the street. I had a job. Well, I was about to lose it. I had a wife. I was about to, you know, I had a home. And uh, Pat, Pat had gone to see an attorney a few weeks before. And, uh, and he, she had said, Howard said that I could put the stuff in my name. And he said, you don't have anything. <laughs> said, he sounds like an alcoholic. Why don't you get him to go to AA? And she come and said that to me. And I said, well, I'm going to, I'll go to AA if I don't control it this time. And anyway, now I was trying one more time to control it because I, if you don't have the craving, <laughs> you're all right. Well, I had the craving. I did not have the willpower to walk by a bar, let alone not stop and have a drink. And I was out of the house on the streets for the last four days of my drinking. And and uh, I came back and I have not wanted or had a drink since then. It just really beat me. And, I, and then you hear Chuck talk about booze surrendering you. I think that's how you surrender. It's the booze surrendered me. And I never wanted to drink again. But I wasn't going to work the steps. But crying out loud, you don't have to be the brightest bulb in the tree. And, uh, you know, to know that that fourth step means you're going to write down what you stole. And then the fifth step is you're going to read it. And then the ninth step is take stuff back. I ain't going to do that. <laughs> now, I'll work the first and twelfth step. That Leo worked the first and the twelfth step. And that sounded good to me. I don't hear very many two-steppers anymore. Uh, but but that was attractive to newcomers. I don't care. Work the first step and the twelve is, is, is attractive. Now, all that other stuff pushes you away a lot more than than religion does because nobody wants to go through that other stuff. And uh, uh, I I was going to do the first and the twelfth, and that didn't quite do it. And then I was going to do the tenth, and I couldn't. I never did the tenth step, even though I was committed to it one time. 
for years. But anyway, I said to Kenny, I'm not going to work the first of the, uh, I'm, I'm not going to work the steps. Uh, and, uh, I don't believe God's in my life. I believe in God, but I don't believe he's in my life. And, uh, can I still be an AA? He said, of course. And I said, well, what would my program be? And he said, go to a meeting every night for 30 nights in a row. Fact is, I'll take you. And, uh, I, I said, well, would you, would you be my sponsor? And he said, no, I want to take you to different meetings. And, uh, when you find a meeting you're comfortable with, then you'll find somebody in there to be your sponsor. And, uh, he took me to meetings. Uh, the second meeting was the, the, um, Smokey Newton meeting over in, uh, anyway, uh, they were, and, and uh, this is the, the next Tuesday night, it was the Pacific Group, and it was on Ohio Avenue. We, I don't know why we got the word Ohio Street, but it's the Ohio Street building on Ohio Avenue, and we ain't going to change that. <laughs> the 2 plus 2 is not going to change its name, and it hadn't been 2 plus 2 for 45 years. Uh, anyway, uh, I, uh, I, uh, started, he said we'll go to meetings, and we went to meetings, and, and on the way to one meeting, he said, why don't you listen? No, he, he never told me, sit down, shut up, and listen. I am not a great believer in that, because if being told to sit down, shut up, and listen was helpful, I wouldn't have needed a hell of a lot of help since I was four years old. If that was going to do it for me. But he did say on the way to the meeting, listen to what people are saying with an open mind. If it doesn't sound good to you, don't even consider it. But if it sounds good to you, take it home with you. Put it in your program. Make it part of your life. In the meantime, don't drink. Now, he said, I can't really ask you not to drink because I drank uh, uh, between meetings when I first got sober, but I will tell you, it works better if you don't. <laughs> he said, it never started working for me until I stopped drinking between meetings. And, uh, and, I, and I did listen, and I went to meetings and listened. And it wasn't very long until I heard this old guy say, uh, uh, if you make one mistake and then brood about making that mistake, you've made two mistakes. And the brooding is the worst consequence of the mistake most of the time. Is that wisdom or not? That's wisdom. I took that right home and brooded about brooding. I could not stop brooding. I heard Ski from San Diego say, I was 36 years in learning that all the people that I hated didn't feel the hate that was killing me. I'm taking that home. I hated Steve for saying that because I could not stop it. And really, you see, I didn't realize that what I was doing was taking home hope for the first time in my life. I was taking home hope. And uh, I could not do those things. I went to a meeting and uh, this this judge said, uh, if you're new in AA or O in AA and you're not working the steps, AA will stop being fun and you'll decide AA doesn't work and uh, uh, you're not going to meetings anymore. You're not going to drink, but you're not going to meetings. He said... If you don't go to meetings, the night will come when you go to the bar and order a drink. And if you do that, and the bartender says, what's the matter? I thought you was going to AA. Don't AA work? He said, if you're not working the steps, be honest with him and tell him, you don't know if AA would work or not because you didn't try. That was transforming to me. 
And on the way home, I decided I was going to work the step. My sponsor had moved out of town. He moved just a couple of towns away, so he was still my sponsor. But we didn't have much one-on-one -on -one time. And I kind of worked my way through with a little guidance from him, the steps the first time. I took the first half of the first step. I was not going to drink again. I can do that 100%. And uh, I believed in God. I didn't believe God was controlling my life other than through immutable law. But I accepted that. Then I did an inventory which really focused on the tall poles and the tent. You know, the first time through, you don't just those are the things that you do. And, and and one of the things I had in my head all the time was my dad, and I resented hell out of him. And another thing I had was that I got stolen equipment that's going to cause me trouble. And another, you know, there was there, there was some stuff like that, and. Uh, I forgave Dad. I did exactly what the, the, the sick man's prayer says on page 67. I asked God, who I don't believe is in my life, but I asked God to show me how I could give him patience, tolerance, kindliness, and pity or compassion. And I was guided some way so that I saw my dad had a seventh grade, there's no way, and I didn't, I wasn't able to give him a chance to be a good father if I just kept messing up the way I'm messing up, and I'm telling you, I did things I'm smarter than to do if I'm conscious of what I'm doing. But there ain't no, you know, it, it was, there was no way he was going to understand that, and, uh, and so he beat me. And, uh, but I was able to cut him slack. I was, and, and I no longer resented him. That's a big thing. My sponsor, actually, anyway, my sponsor turns out to have been a high school friend of the fence. And at one time they shared an apartment when they were mutually between wives and drinking together. And when I told him about the equipment, he said, who was the fence? And I told him I lost the equipment. I, don't, I, and I told him, and in a half hour, he called me back and told me where the equipment was, what it would cost. Pat and I went to the bank and borrowed the money. I, I, this was a, not a money-making deal. I went in there, and I paid him for the equipment, and I took it back to work. I uh, took Pat home and took it back to work. And... Uh, uh, my boss said, don't bring that in here. Take it down to the equipment lab, and the calibration lab. And I said, I know that, Frank, but my sponsor said I should tell you that I've taken this back. And uh, uh, if you're new, wait till your sponsor tells you to do that. Because, But it was the right thing in this case. And and uh, my boss called me in the next day and said, I've had it calibrated in perfect working order. I don't know where it's been, but I know it wasn't stolen because I have it. And if it had been stolen, I wouldn't have it, would I? And I said, no. And he said, don't ever tell anybody that you stole it. And I haven't up till the night. I want to mention it to the new people tonight for the first time. Because the next morning when I woke up, I was free. You know, it takes a little time to take things in, good or bad. And I, I got it. I'm free of this. And when I got that I was free of it, I had essentially the same feeling that I had when I drank my first half of the half of my history. The same feeling, only I went up to an eight and then back down to a four. That's, that, and that just, I'm, I'm telling you, if we keep at this, I don't care. I know from 
hearing other people talk, it keeps working for, and I can see it working for people with 55 years. I can see it working for them. They are transforming just like we are. It's, it's kind of an asymptotic learning curve in that the growth you get the first year, let's say, is 15% better. Now, to get that, you need two more years to get another 15%. Four more years to get another, this is my theory, four more years to get another 15%, eight more, 16, and, uh, and so it, the growth slows down, but it's relentless. And, and I'm telling you, once in a while we get to feel innate. But that's not the life we're looking to live. We're looking for sixes, okay? What the hell did you ever do in your life to deserve an ongoing eight? <laughs> if you want an ongoing eight, work the steps again and again. And, uh, I have, I have learned to do that. And, and, uh, but I also, okay, Frank taught me to meditate. It became an important, an important part of my sobriety from, from July. It's still an, it was always an important part, but from Octo, October the 1st, 1974, until July of 2002, I meditated for 30 minutes every morning. I did not miss a morning. And I just just found that uh, every six months I changed my meditation, but I tried to align myself with what I thought the rules were. You know, the immutable laws. And this actually wasn't that bad a deal. And and uh I I planned my day, uh I I asked for guidance when I when I couldn't make a decision. When agitated or doubtful, I stopped and got centered again. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I don't ask much of you about prayer and meditation. It's just constantly. And except for that, it has no big part in the game at all. And when you go to bed at night. Uh, and, and I was doing that. And, and, and it, my, I went from, I went back into management. I got a job as a, uh, and I believe my goal was to have this job of being a manager of a technical section in the systems engineering department and the helicopter design division on the Apache helicopter. That was my goal, and I got it when I was, I reached it when I was nine years sober. That was, well, the thing is, I had a baby elephant belief that said, when you reach your goal, you have no more hills to climb. That the problems of getting there are stressful, and, and, and you got to work hard to get through there. But once you get it, it's like the little train that could. You know, it's done it, and now it's a downhill drag. Well, that was my experience for two days. On the third day, they gave me an assignment that was way over my head. I was, I was not the guy to do this. And, and uh, they kept insisting I was and that they'd give me a 30% pay increase so that I would be, I was the guy. And uh, I, I started, okay, the next day, well, I was going to say I started my meditation. I actually sat there and was very conscious of the dreadfulness that was happening to me for about 15 minutes. And then I meditated, and I felt good. Now, when I felt good, I knew don't back out of the meditation. My timer went off, and I did not, I did not stop the meditation because I knew I would back out into dreadfulness. And my head said, why do I have to do this? The executive vice president to give me this assignment, I know he doesn't do it. When he sees a problem, he recognizes the problem, it has to be solved, but it don't threaten them personally. And I am personally threatened unless I, unless I'm into the program better than I was that day. And I said, why me? 
And then I saw a frozen lake in my mind's eye. You guys would know about these. This was a Minneapolis frozen lake. And the ice was as thick as ice, the laws of physics will allow ice to get. And I knew you could put a swimming tank on that ice and it would support it. And as soon as I knew that, a thought came to me. Uh, or some schizophrenic idea, but I, I, Clancy told me once, he wanted me to understand two things about prayer. When we, when we talk to God, we call that prayer. And when God talks to us, we call that schizophrenia. And, uh, <laughs> I'm not, you know, I don't think I'm schizophrenic. But I also, I'm not sure, I've never been sure, except once in a while, I'm sure, that it's not my intellect. It's not just calming my mind, the way I could do with whiskey, the way that I could calm up with meditation, so that my brain won't work. I get input to stuff that my brain was never exposed to. So that makes me think it's coming from some other, other source of power. And, uh, but anyway, I felt, I, the thought came to me, or the voice said, and when, the, if it was a thought, it sounded like a voice. And it said, that's right, Howard. If you look at the ice and walking across the ice a step at a time, that's a good metaphor for living your life a day at a time. But if you're not absolutely convinced that the ice is thick enough to support you, you're going to dread every step you take. And if you're not absolutely convinced that your life is supported, you're going to dread every day that you face a new day. And and I just backed out of the meditation I said, I'll make the presentation. I'm going to go ahead with this. And if it works, it's because I'm going to trust God that it worked. And it worked way beyond anything you could imagine. That actually was was successful enough that I ended up being the department manager. And and it was it, that was several years later, but but my life has been that way. And nothing has happened in my life to cause me to stop believing. What did happen in my life was I, I stopped, I stopped stopping in the middle of the day if I was agitated or doubtful. I had pretty good days, no stress. I had retirement money coming in, had a business I owned, everything's going good, Pat and I are having fun, good life. And, and so we didn't stop when agitated or doubtful, and uh, uh, we did meditate. Then we started kind of hitting the snooze alarm on the early morning meditation, and, and just gradually I disengaged. Now, the business I had, I got it, I know, because God wanted me to have it. And then I disengaged from God, and I knew personally that this was what God wanted. And then the short story is the Walmart of comedy clubs moved to town and mom and pop had to sell to them. And I, you know, the fact is you don't want to be disengaged from God when those things happen. Because now you've got to hook up again, which we can do. It's just a matter of of getting up early in the morning, meditating, doing the same thing, and you can do it. But I could also see that, that, uh, I would, if I had it to do over, I mean, I heard Butch last night and, and what he said is exactly the truth. We cannot let up on our spiritual program. We're heading for trouble if we do. And I, I, I but, I'll tell you, and you're heading for trouble in your life, it's gonna happen. I don't care how good your life is, One day you're going to get old and sick or your wife is going to have a stroke and then have another stroke and another one. And and uh, 
and you, you and her have been married for 60 years, and you aren't ready to give that up. And, and so you have to have a strength to look for the goodness. Okay? And in order to do that, you have to have what Chuck C. said, you have to have before you can have the feeling of unity with God. That is, at the start of the second chapter of his book, you must have a personally satisfactory, conscious partnership with the God that created you in this entire business of living. And that's what we have, but we, we need to be satisfied with that, and we need to be conscious of that. And the program gives us that, but we have to work, I have to work for it. But that's what I'm working for. Now, my wife had a stroke. And uh, I know that all suffering, and I know this because I, I know it. Because my life tells me this. AA don't ask me to will myself to assent to something that I can't validate in my lifetime. And uh, any suffering that I have had became an essential feature of some greater goodness that could have only happened in that mysterious way. All I got to do to satisfy myself with that is look at my life and see that. So I'm going into this knowing that there's suffering here, but some greater goodness is going to happen. Now, I see her on a walker with her nose running and crying and uh, her head down. And she, uh, before that, she was in bed and she said, I don't want to go on. I don't want to just live to live. I, I, I want to do things. And I said, yeah, but listen, there's, there's all kinds of stuff uh, uh, neural pathways that you build new ones. Uh, plasticity, neural plasticity. Uh, uh, we need to get you into physical therapy. And, and I meant in a week or so. And that afternoon she said, can you help me out of bed? <laughs> and I thought, I ought to call a doctor. And then I thought, hell no. I'll, and I got her to walk her and she got on it and she was slobbering her nose was running. And I felt good. Why? Because I saw her in bed when she couldn't get up. And ever since then, I have seen her getting better and better. And the time came when uh, it was it was uh, our 60th anniversary, and we went to Mackinac Island in, in Wisconsin. I don't know if you guys have seen the movie Some Place in Time, but I'm telling you, I played Reeves' part in this, this reliving. <laughs> anyway, we went to Mackinac Island. And uh, last December, we went to New York City. Uh, the second week in New York City, we were on the 44th Street and Fifth Avenue. And uh, we did it all in New York City. Walked around uh, and, and took the tours and, and saw the Christmas and went to the Radio City Music Hall. It was just a wonderful thing. And then when we came home in January, we went to Yellowstone when it was eight below zero. Why? Because she's always wanted to. And we did it. And I'm glad we did it. And, and, and when it came time to come to St. Paul, Minnesota, to the Gopher State Roundup, she come with me. And we are enjoying life together in a way that we could we had never enjoyed life before. And it isn't that that life is easier. It is that it is better because we have a different perception of what's good and what's bad. Uh, it's a hell of a deal. Um, I, I, meditation was an important part of it. I was reading this article on meditation. Uh, uh, it, it said, whatever way 
you find God, that is the right way for you. If you find God the way Pat does, and she just is conscious of God's presence, and she has spiritual ideas about the universe that she just has, and uh, it just comes to her, and that's the right way for her. Now me, I've got to look at what Bill Wilson says, science tells us so, and we have no reason to doubt it. So I look at for the spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things, he said the perfectly logical assumption is that if it's in the material world, he doesn't say this verbatim, but he says if it's in the material world, and uh, if, if you just stop for a second and be conscious, okay, I'm done. Be, <laughs> the, if you're conscious of your weight on the chair, that's because you have a perfect distribution of particles in your massive body and a perfect balance in the forces of nature. The electromagnetic force in the electron is 10 to the 37th power and that in the proton is 10 to the 37th power. Gravity is 1. But those forces are balanced so perfectly that gravity becomes the dominating force. Now, that may be luck, but I don't believe that. I believe it's convincing evidence of the presence of the spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things. And if it's in the spirit of the universe, it's in life as we see it, including the circumstances and events of life and the character and quality of those circumstances and events of life. I must come to believe that and I must practice that in my life. The book says, whatever way you find God is the right way. But remember this, wherever you see God pass, mark that spot and go sit in that window again. Alcoholics Anonymous is my window. This is where I come. This is where I see God pass. Thank you for letting me share with you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.